think it's imperative to have more women in the legal workforce, uh, not only from a talent perspective, but also from an EQ perspective. I think that women bring a lot of qualities to the table that can't be underestimated. So I am an absolute great believer in compromising uh, for short periods of time so that the women can flower for the longer periods of time. Welcome to the Anahita Speaker Series, presented by Carnegie India, celebrating stirring stories of empowerment, struggle, and success from women working in different fields across the world, stories we hope will inspire young professionals. I'm Priyadarshini D, Associate Fellow with the Tech and Society Program at Carnegie India, and on today's episode, I'll be speaking to Ms. Zia Modi. Zia Modi needs no introduction, and frankly, it's a little difficult to encompass her achievements in a few lines, but let me try. She is one of India's top corporate attorneys, She's a specialist in mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures and corporate restructurings, just to name a few. She's a co-founder and the managing partner of AZB and Partners, one of India's top law firms with several practice areas consistently ranked number one in multiple league tables. She has won several awards and accolades over the years and more recently ranked number one in 2018 and 2019 in Fortune India's 50 most powerful women in business in India. Her roster of clients includes the who's who of India's business landscape, and, and this is a description that has stayed with me, she's on speed dial of some of the most powerful corporate houses in India. Ms. Modi, welcome to Anahita. We're truly privileged to have you with us today. My pleasure. Very happy to be here. Thank you. Passionate, thorough, ambitious, pragmatic. You're known for your plain speak and fairness to both sides of a transaction. You're trusted by some of the biggest corporate names and you've been called tenacious and a force of nature. How important has it been to cultivate these qualities and values in the course of your career? And how hard did you have to work for them? Was it harder as a woman in a largely male dominated space? I think a lot of, a lot of it has to do with my personality. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I've always operated on the basis that uh, time is the enemy. And so uh, straight speak is probably the best way to save on those precious moments where you can do other things. So I think that uh, I've grown up believing that frank advice and trusted advice will ultimately be more appreciated. That uh, risk assessment of a client's uh, actions uh, is what you have to look out for. That's the real value add and the care that you give to the client. Uh, the ability of the client to assess risk 20 years ago was very different from now, much more alert to the risk than they were earlier. And I think sometimes even when I started young, I was okay in my head uh, giving slightly unpopular or inconvenient advice if you like, simply because I did not want later to be questioned as to whether I had not alerted the client to the actual regulatory and commercial risks that would happen. So I think uh, the answer is my nature probably uh, overtook the niceties of uh, communication and uh, I think that that has continued with me. As you grow older, you can be franker than when you were younger, Priyadarshini. That's the truth. And, 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 you know, and this is something that have, uh, um, you know, seen written about you, heard about you, that you're fair to both sides of the transaction. So not just your client, but, you know, the opposite party as well. And I was just wondering what is, you know, sort of the ethos or um, why that, why is that an important quality that you have cultivated? I think the reason it's important is that uh, there are two ways. One, if you are doing a transaction, and if you don't wear the hat of the other side, uh, you won't close a transaction. 
if you just keep saying i want it only my way you ultimately won't get a deal done so i very often uh discuss with our clients exactly what would be the pain points of the counterparty and what can we give in to what we can compromise on what we can't compromise on and so you end up essentially doing what every good lawyer does is risk assess and trade so you negotiate some that you can give away you don't negotiate some that you can't give away the commercially or from a regulatory point of view but you come across as not being hard every time if on every position is the no 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 then your ability to influence your own client is very limited if all he's saying is no your ability to get the confidence of the other side is zero because all you're saying is no and actually you need not be saying no all the time so i think it's a bit of pulling internally and then it's going out into the negotiation room and sensibly discussing what is the bid ask on several positions and coming to a landing that works for both sides as i always say there's a family settlement if everybody is unhappy then the lawyers have succeeded nobody should be too happy because then the other side feels cheated similarly in an m and a negotiation there are some points that you're unhappy about there are some points that you're okay with by and large if you feel you've got a fair deal on both sides and that's what i think our job is to ensure that there's a fair deal on both sides and it works most of the time Right, right, and 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 you know, I mentioned a whole host of adjectives earlier. I was just wondering, you know, apart from those that have come naturally to you because of your personality, was there anything that you needed to cultivate because you were a woman in what what is you know, as I said earlier, largely male dominated space, whether it was earlier or you know when you set foot into the legal career or even today for that matter. So I first started my profession in New York. and when i was in new york i was very young i was more worried about being a good junior rather than a woman or a man then when i came back to india in 1983 84 uh i used to go to court because india had not opened up from a mna perspective because of fera there i felt as a female junior that i was often uh, one of the very few uh, actually opening my mouth as a woman and i did feel the peer pressure in the court uh just instinctively i suppose uh my reaction to that was to over prepare to make sure that i was not going to be caught napping that nobody in the court including all the young male lawyers the senior male lawyers the judges could ever point at me and say she missed this case or she hadn't read that page that was my compensatory behavior uh did i feel uh that there was you know very very few women yeah that was a fact that they were but did that sort of stop me from wanting to open my mouth i guess i took it more as a challenge but i was miss p for paranoid all right um um and i uh, my next question i think uh, this is a question that comes to you very very often um but um, let me ask it anyway your father the late soli sorab ji was a former attorney general of india a legal luminary and a legend in his own right um what i was wondering is was it ever difficult or a disadvantage being the daughter of or living up to the reputation of such an eminent lawyer at any point in time in your career so the truth is that you know very early on i realized that i was not going to uh, compete with my father it was just not possible and nor did i want to uh, take on internally any such challenge i very early on in my career when i came back understood uh, the living legend that he was uh, the type of achievements that he had accomplished and i was not in play for that i think what i did was definitely use uh, the gravamen and the statesmanship that my father brought to the table to often consult with him on issues that i faced in some cases i think in our entire lives my father and i must have done less than 10 cases together i was in bombay he was in delhi 
uh, and the ones that we did uh, were short and sweet. They weren't long trials where you could really sort of uh, learn from the banyan tree. So what happened was that uh, I drew on my father a lot for his wisdom, for some strategy in some cases, uh, where instinctively I felt uncomfortable, uh, where I needed some guidance on, you know, jurisprudence. So that was the symbiotic relationship that I developed. Uh, did I live under his shadow? Uh, I think the answer is, uh, of course, reputationally, I will always live under his shadow. But I think being in Bombay and he in Delhi, I was able to chart an independent course as a junior counsel. And then, of course, when I moved to transaction and corporate m and uh, that was not his field at all. And since I didn't keep the last name Sorabji, uh, not many people outside the courtroom uh, knew initially or sometimes ever that I was his daughter. So I felt comfortable that they were also appreciating me for my own value. There was a profile done a few, a few years ago and uh, the chapter on you starts with a quote by him. I think uh, it goes something like this. I'm paraphrasing here. Um, he starts by saying, you know, Zia was, uh, you know, known as my daughter. But today I'm known as Zia's um, father. <laughs> but that is because in New York on a couple of trips that he made, when I used to take him to meet my friends, they used to say, oh, you're Zia's daddy or Zia's father. And that's what amused him a lot because that was an environment which didn't know him. So he was just being cute. <laughs> Okay. Um, you wear so many hats in your life. Uh, you've been voted one of the most powerful women entrepreneurs several times. You're, as I mentioned earlier, one of India's top corporate lawyers. You're also a mother and a wife. How similar or different are you in your functioning in each of these roles? And if I may ask, which of these roles gives you a greater sense of purpose? <laughs> Well, you know, uh, depending on the week or the time of day, I often think that I've been a somewhat failed mother. Uh, I now have grandchildren and I'm worried I'll be a slightly failed grandmother. So I think that uh, if you ask me which part of my life I've sacrificed the most, it would probably be my role as a mother, which you often regret and you don't know how it's ever going to play out in the minds of your children who love you. But uh, hopefully, you know, you have their forgiveness and life goes on. In terms of my career, I was, I guess, so intense about being a successful woman lawyer and not wanting that to uh, bring me down. That I think in terms of time, again, time being the enemy, I overcompensated in that part of my life, I would think, than others. I think in hindsight, uh, there probably was no other way. Because if you didn't spend that extra time, if you didn't have the ability and the preparation to show that you were right up there and everybody stopped thinking of you as a woman and as a good lawyer, uh, then you wouldn't succeed. So, uh, and was that a, a purposive? Of course, it was purposive for me. Very much wanted to have a good career, very much wanted to shine, very much wanted my parents to be proud of me. So, I would say that that hat took a disproportionate amount of my life. Um, so, that's my work and that's my being a mother. I could also, let me add, I'm also a Baha'i by religion and a practicing Baha'i. And that again is a religion that expects you to devote time just in terms of social activities, community activities. Again, I think when I came back, I uh, put in a lot more time into that. I think today I would guilt myself that I do not put enough time for that. So when one talks about, you know, fading down, I think that will take up a larger part of my balance sheet. Right, right. And if we could just probe you a little, um, how have you, if you have uh, indeed done so, um, used this experience and, you know, uh, the disproportionate uh, emphasis on your career? How has that influenced you as you built 
what was, I think, when it started, uh, 12 lawyer chambers of Zia Modi to what is today, 650 member law firm with multiple, you know, um, um, branches across the country and uh, some really fantastic m &A deals under your belt. So how have you sort of taken that experience and used that as you built this uh, organization? So, you know, uh, the 12 member law firm came when Manmohan Singh announced the FDI policy. Foreigners started coming back to India. My friends and colleagues at my law firm, Baker and McKenzie, and the other law firm friends that I had made started sending me work. And so it just cascaded naturally. And we were very lucky uh, because we got the opportunity in that sense. But at that time, you know, laws were changing every single day. And you had to be up to speed every single day. And there was no website. There was no uh, computer uh, uh, prompting that could happen. And so what we really did was we just work the long hours, cold pizza every night, all of us making sure that we got the uh, latest position, which came out literally the day before, right? Didn't take anything for granted. Worked till 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock at night. All of us, merry band of 12 just trying to keep our head above water, making sure we could compete with the traditional law firms that had been around for hundreds of years, 100 years, uh, and uh, to be as modern, responsive, facilitative, taking all the lessons that I learned from my four or five years in New York and uh, creating a very energetic set of young folks, some of which are still with us today. Right, right. And uh, do you ensure that there is some sort of work-life balance um, today amongst your <laughs> I colleagues? think that definitely <laughs> our colleagues have more of a work-life balance than they did before. Uh, I think I continue to have a lesser of a work-life balance than I would like. I think it's just become habit now. Uh, but I think for the youngsters, there is a balance that they demand and they want. Uh, to be able to enjoy, uh, you know, a good weekend, enjoy some time out, uh, have a, a life that isn't 24-7 only work. And I think that all law firms are evolving to make sure that that is achieved because otherwise, you know, what do you thrive on? You thrive on talent. And if talent is uh, dissatisfied constantly, and the work-life balance issues are not addressed, at least to some extent, uh, because, you know, clients are demanding. When clients are demanding, then that's it. There's nothing else that uh, matters from the client perspective. And then if your life is going to be swallowed up by one client or the other, then it becomes something that management has to tackle. So right. it's a struggle, but I think definitely I would say there is more work-life balance than there was when I started with our band of 12. You've been a champion of women's rights and have advocated a greater role for them in all aspects of our society, including the legal profession. Um, I was wondering, what do you think are the reasons for the low percentage of women judges in the judiciary today, particularly the higher judiciary? I think it's just a question of less women being able to stay the course in the legal profession, nothing else. And uh, especially at the council level, because the women judges are mainly those that come up from the court or the district. And I think there, uh, it's fairly exacting, you know, if you want to be in court day after day, prepare for every matter night after night, uh, there's probably a higher percentage of women after they have their first kid or after they get married or uh, who drop out. And if they drop out, then the catchment is less, the area is less, the pipeline is less, the funnel is less. And I think that's what happens, essentially. Um, would, you have, uh, would you have any thoughts around what could be done to ensure there are more women in the Indian judiciary? Uh, and uh, what I was going to say is that the current CJI has mentioned recently that uh, he is committed to seeing a women judge as a CJI in the near future. So do you think, do you see this happening in the next decade? I hope so. I think that, you know, uh, I would really rely on male mentors, uh, senior counsel who have good juniors who are women to make sure that they hold on to them, that they find ways to 
uh, see that they come back to the profession and uh, it would only be uh, possible if you allow women the safety net of the breaks they need to take at the relevant point in their careers. If you just expect them to keep pounding on the same pace that men, even though they are doing so much more in that sense, their bodies are going through changes, their lifestyle, their sense of guilt is at an all-time high. They are not necessarily supported by their in-laws or their husbands. Travel takes up an excessive amount of time if you are a successful counsel traveling from one court to the other. It's all the mix of things. And I think that really what will have more women judges if there are more women who continue to practice and the uh, uh, assessment of women which is taken up by the chief and the collegium and the high court uh, collegium is one which recognizes that you know you might not have a hundred reported judgments but the quality of the reported judgments are good the ethos of the woman is fantastic and that ultimately when she does sit on the bench she's able to be a just and fair individual right i think i have to ask you at this juncture do you regret leaving your litigation a thriving litigation practice i think my father regrets it regretted it i think i'm okay uh because i enjoy what i do i still get involved in some key litigations with the firm i do use and give my strategic inputs to our dispute team as required and uh, you know the way i look at it i can always go back and wear my band and gown uh, ultimately it's if you have an ability to argue and i argue every day so i was just thinking that you know seeing your success and your achievements in the corporate career i was just wondering if uh, could you have been the female cji uh, perhaps if you had you know stayed the course <laughs> But you're also a member on the board of, sorry. Who knows, I see. <laughs> um, but you're also a member on the board of many companies. Uh, and um, No, as you... I'm not. not I'm not. Mind. In fact, uh, I was on the board of uh, three companies. Uh, one was HSBC in Hong Kong, from which I stepped down last year after 16 years. I am on the board of one company in Hong Kong and one company in Singapore, but I don't have any board positions in India. Um, nonetheless, if I could ask, would you have any um, uh, you know thoughts around why there is you know less representation of women on the Indian boards as well uh, from your previous experience, perhaps? And uh, I think because that the reason way. why is because there is an unequal pass test for women as opposed to men. I think that when the board wants to appoint female directors, they want superstar women. But you know, the average male director is hardly superstar, right? They get into enough trouble all the time. So I think the benchmark for appointment of women is that, oh, we just don't want a token women. But why are women always token unless they're superstars? Every male director is hardly a superstar. They're average. Some are bright, reasonably bright. Some are not so bright. So I think what you have to look for when you look for a woman director is the quality of the discourse. The uh, personality of the woman, is she balanced? Uh, is she able to have a sensible discussion? Is she collegial? Simply all the qualities that you would look for in a male director. The minute you start saying, we need something more in your mind, if not on paper, from a woman director, and automatically your catchment area reduces and then you have the same women who are fantastic going on multiple boards but you're not creating a new funnel of women that would probably be as good as sensible and as practical you know you've been affiliated with many government and industry bodies in india and abroad just to name a couple uh, in in the past the reserve bank of india committee on comprehensive financial services for small businesses the World Bank Administrative Tribunal, the London Court of International Arbitration, and many of your colleagues in AZB and partners are also, you know, um, have been on various working groups and committees set up by the government from time to time. Um, 
I was wondering how important do you think this role is for the corporate legal sector to participate in influencing the public policy as well? And how do you think law firms like yours can play a larger role? I think uh, most law firms can play this role only, which is to be part of committees, to drive discussions, to do good advocacy, to wear the right hat, not just a client's vested interest, but to understand what are the pain points of the government and to try and suggest via medias that ultimately make the ease, ease of doing business better. Now, that's the agenda, right? And the government's not going to agree to your point of view if there is a clear issue that they are facing. Simply because you're shouting about it doesn't matter. And so I think these committees and ad advocacy attempts are really to find middle ground and to go forward step by step. I mean... I, I don't think big, big bang reforms are possible anymore. I think that it's, uh, you know, the good ant that climbs slowly but deliberately. And that's the approach that I think these committees take and that a lot of us at AZB would like to be part of. Right, right. And, um, you know, if I could ask you, what are the two or three key developments in the legal world that you're looking forward to, which you think will set either a higher bar for the legal pro profession? or, you know, it's going to be consequential for the legal world. So, for instance, um, could it be the liber potential liberalization of the legal um, sector in terms of allowing foreign law firms to function here, which could change, which could alter the competitive landscape? Uh, could it be what we discussed earlier in terms of uh, the current gender disparity and improving that? I know that in the corporate legal world, it's slightly better than it is in the judiciary, but is there room for more? Or could it be uh, in terms of reaching for higher ideals, where I think, again, uh, Justice Ramana in the past, and even Justice Chandrachud in the past, have mentioned how law firms could probably play a larger role uh, in taking on pro bono work? Or could it be the digital transformation in the legal world, right? There is now, um, you know, in the last two years, you've seen online dispute resolution, online filing, a whole bunch of other, um, you know, uh, technological innovations. So could it be that? So I leave it up to you, but, you know, you're with us. You're one of the finest legal minds. And I think it's fair to ask a question uh, as to what you see as the two, three legal developments. I think one of the biggest developments that would help and the pain points that would assist would be the backlog. The backlog of cases and digitization, uh, better processes. You know, today the largest litigator is the government. And the reason for that is that there is a fear of settling, fear of compromising, and therefore everybody just pushes it to the system, to the courts. Uh, if there is a way to resolve that by proper discussion and interaction, I think. Uh, uh, not only would the law firm fraternity be thrilled, the judiciary will be thrilled and the government would be even more thrilled. Uh, that makes the quicker functioning of the court system and therefore access to justice quicker. One of our main points has been that, you know, if you file a case and you have to wait for 10 years, how does it work, right? And then if you're just operating on interim orders, then that's not really the best way it works. So I think that... Uh, by and large, the biggest pain point that I see, which is in need of dire reform, is the backlog. That is one. The next is that uh, the uh, foreign law firms, I think that uh, a lot of them have India offices sitting out of London. A lot of them have sort of captive offices sitting in India. So I think that uh, because they waited so long for formal opening, they've all found their via medias as they like. Uh, so I don't think there's any law firm that doesn't have access to an India desk anywhere in the world. They, when we go and meet them, we meet their India desks and the foreign law firms. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, for the benefit of women, more can be done simply in the law firm space by leaders in the law firms ensuring that women have more catchment safety areas and safety nets so that they don't have to leave their career but they can always come back or take a break for a shorter time or slow down for part of the time. Uh, I think it's imperative to have more women in the legal workforce, uh, not only from a talent perspective but also from an EQ perspective. I think that women bring a lot of qualities to the table that can't be underestimated. So I am an absolute great believer in 
compromising uh, for short periods of time so that the women can flower for the longer periods of time. And I think that will happen because you can't ignore talent. And half of our women, half of our talent are women. And, um, you know, despite the pandemic over the last two years, we being India has been one of the most exciting destinations uh, for private equity and venture capital investments among, amongst uh, emerging markets. But in contrast, the private domestic investment has been extremely cautious. Um, and I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on, you know, uh, why this might be. And the government has also taken a whole host of uh, uh, initiatives here. So is there something more you think that can be done? I think it's a work in progress. I think for a long time, uh, a lot of domestics were over leveraged. And then came the threat of the insolvency and bankruptcy code, where you could be removed from management overnight. And therefore, a lot of people did not invest domestically, domestic people, but were really more worried about the leverage, making sure they didn't fall into the insolvency trap. And so you saw less domestic m and if you like, fresh money coming in. Whatever money was being generated by the companies was really being used a lot to deleverage. But I think domestic activity has also picked up simply because with all the schemes of the government like Arta Dirban and Make in India, uh, we want to become a global supply chain. And that we can only do if we have manufacturing, not just services. And I think with the move away from China, India will benefit. I think that a lot of multinationals will look to have a de-risking approach and to set up a real industry in India. But all this takes time. A factory doesn't happen overnight. And the workforce also has to be skilled. COVID has meant a lot of people have gone back to where they were uh, originally from. Coming back is always a disruption in their minds. So I think it will happen. I think it will take another two to three to maybe four years. But I think that, you know, it's ours to lose. For me, India is the story. Right. right. You have a great list of achievements under your belt. I wonder though, is there something or is there, is there anything at all that you still aspire to accomplish? Um, and if so, what motivates you? I think I want more peace of mind now. I think that, uh, you know, uh, running a law firm is not easy. Uh, it's a lot of people management. It's a lot of uh, being able to balance aspirations, achievements, accomplishments, fairness, um, aspirations. Um, and of course, you know, the constant uh, work to keep the firm at the top of the heap. Uh, in terms of, and it's absolutely not me alone, it can never be, right? And so to keep uh, so many superstars and good lawyers uh, chugging that same path, being proud of the letterhead, wanting to be number one all the time, creating the reputation of the firm, protecting the letterhead, day in and day out. So I think uh, that's the pleasure, but that's also... Uh, the paranoia, as I say. Is there any advice at all you would have for the younger generation of lawyers in terms of what they should be doing differently than perhaps what you did in your own career? So I think that, you know, the advice is to keep the passion. I think that uh, uh, a lot of young lawyers today, uh, rightly or wrongly, don't believe they're committed to the law. They can always do something else, which indeed they can. Uh, for us, as the older generation, uh, we, in our mind, started and we want to die as lawyers and super lawyers. And therefore, I think the only thing that that means is that you've got to invest in yourself, you've got to invest in your own knowledge. You have to accept that your own knowledge gives you the power that is pleasurable. And you have to make sure that you're willing to stay the course. And you can't stay the course if you don't love what you do. So you've just got to be passionate about your career. Thank you so much, Ms. Modi, for sharing your experiences and insights with us. It was such a pleasure and a privilege to gain, gain just a glimpse into your fascinating life and career. Most welcome. Very happy to be part of this. Thank you. To our audience, I hope you had a great time listening to the episode. We'll be back with a new speaker soon. Do subscribe to Carnegie India's YouTube channel for similar content. Thank you and goodbye.